welcome to the latest edition of the Chambridge podcast project. I'm talking today with uh, Gadi Taub from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who's a lecturer in uh, journalism, an author, a historian, and has been a screenwriter as well. So we're, we're looking to Gadi's insights into the current um, situation with Hamas in Israel. Gadi is also running a, a podcast, is that right, with Mike yeah. Durant, um, yeah. on, on Rumble? On Rumble, called Israel uh, Update. Called Israel Update. So if you want the latest updates on uh, Mike Duran and Gaddy's thinking, go there. But I was going to ask Gaddy about, um, firstly, well, what's the mood in um, Tel Aviv at the moment? And... Um, the the question that everybody's sort of um you know uh, asking in in the west is when and if uh, a land invasion will be launched into the gaza strip um so i think the first thing to say is that we have been jolted back out of globalist la la land mm -hmm. into back into Jewish history, and, and I guess maybe I, sh I should say back into history. We in the West have been deluding ourselves about many things, and one of them is that everyone is like us, in the sense that, this, that everybody in the end has the same view of life and is motivated by the same desires. So Israel assumed for a long time that, that Hamas could be tamed because as uh, I think Obama lectured us on this, um, Palestinians too want a good life for their children. They want an education and sound employment. And, and we, we shared that vision. And we thought that with enough um, aid, enough uh, patience, and, and, and enough care for the well-being of Palestinians, which meant giving them quite a bit of Qatari money, Mm. then we will have them deterred because they will not give up what they what they have and and apparently it, we were we were gravely mistaken and as as this attack showed um the the palestinians are willing to go to great lengths and make huge sacrifices for the sheer uh, goal of the religious and cultural goal that the muslim brotherhood is cultivating for murdering Jews. And we saw an orgy of violence. And I don't want to, to to subject your listeners to the descriptions of the unbelievable inhuman horrors. They can probably find them all online or, or some of them. Um, but but it, it turns out that we completely misunderstood our neighbors. Yeah, I think that's... Um... That's right. And um, for a long time, we've lived with this progressive delusion that the world is following a, a happy course to universal human rights, progressive democracy and some form yeah. of secularism. And we consistently ignored what Islamists have been saying since at least 2001 and long before that they think were infidels. We live in Jahalia, the state of ignorance, and we deserve whatever we get at the hand. And in, in a sense, um, you know, I, I wrote a piece saying that obviously um, Hamas pay attention to what Islamic State did, you know, and the, the shock of that in the West only is uh, an incentive to manage savagery more brutally, I think. Yeah, and you know, it's the it's the the Fukuyama paradigm that yes. that m mutated and then collapsed because Fukuyama thought we would all be living in liberal democracies, That's but then progressivism evolved into a globalist human rights non democratic regime, and the thinker who realized what was happening, and I think he is the the most seriously underrated thinker in the the, the, the this this first quarter of the. 21st century is John Fonte, um, who who just laid it out and and understood what we don't understand. So I think I, I think that this is not just a turning point in in Israeli uh, history or in Jewish history. Although you know, for Jews, this was 
Israel was founded on the idea that never again, and, and by never again, we did not mean that Jews will no longer die violent deaths. We were ready to die violent deaths because the conflict is ongoing. We meant that we would not die on our knees begging. We would die sovereign people with with our own military and 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 weapons in our hands. I quoted uh, in 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 one in one piece the Ev Sternhal, the historian. I disagreed with him on practically everything. He was a socialist, mm. but one thing uh, remain. I, I think we we shared. Sternhal is one of those professors. He's he's uh, deceased now, but he was one of these professors who saw fascism every in every. Uh, expression of nationalism he saw yeah. fascism but he was still a zionist and this was uh, i mean this was incomprehensible to me in intellectual terms how can you combine extreme anti-nationalism with a zionist view apparently if you're a socialist you can create that magic but what what he he meant actually moves a chord i think in everyone's heart here he's he's a child from the ghetto and he said he remembered Jews being hunted in the streets. And then he said, I saw my friends. Um, I saw my friends killed in wars. Some of them were under my command. And I thought to myself, he said that they died like human beings, not like animals hunted in the street. So, so this was the promise of Israel. So the shock is extreme. And I think it changed, it changed our existential sense of reality. Um, in a very in a very deep sense, but this can also be a turning point for history beyond beyond Israel, because the West has lost its immune system, mm. and we have been living under this, you know, the 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 Obama view of the Middle East, where you can this is a you know these people preach uh, preach against racism all the time, but then they have their um, <laughs> their their. There's soft bigotry of low expectations. They don't take these people seriously. They look at Iran and they don't take them seriously. These people mean what they say. This is exactly uh, the point. Uh, yes, I've, I've made a similar point. Uh, it's very obvious that they do say what they intend to do. You know, it, it's not um, rocket science to find out what their ideological intentions or their religious intentions are. But consistently, you know, when you listen to the Western media, particularly um, what passes for the BBC News these days, <laughs> yeah. it, it is, um, you know, this immediate descent into moral equivalence that, um, oh, they did it not because they want to murder Jews because they think they're infidel and, you know, they they're, need to be wiped from, from the face of the earth in order to create the new caliphate. But because they were deprived, because of um, the deprivation that Israel had imposed upon, you know, the Palestinian peoples, um, they were doing it not for um, religious motives or ideological motives, but from pure, um, you know, victimization uh, motives that they had no alternative. Um, yes. And then, you know, the further point is that um, not only do they give credence to this sort of um, second order motivation thinking, they also state they have to be neutral in presenting the news, which seems to be accepting whatever Hamas says is going on in Gaza is absolutely accurate. Um, this seems to me the descent of the West into total decadence if this continues. Yes, because it's a ritual of purification. Uh, it's it's a narcissistic frame of mind. And also, let me point out, it's a consoling frame of mind. Because if you think that all this violence on behalf of the uh, that the others commit is your fault, then it's up to you to fix it. Then it's fixable. Then everything is okay. And it's not okay, David. It's we are going to have to smash Hamas. Nothing short of that will do. Because now the 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 uh, uh, population centers of the Western Negev, which we call the envelope of Gaza, the surrounding area of Gaza, it can't be repopulated. If you think that beyond the fence mm. are people who are willing to dismember children alive in front of their parents, it's it's uh, it's not something that anyone would go to live by, mm. and and uh, progressives uh, are are in a sense a a decadent, as you say, and a shallower. 
form of pacifism. They they are not willing to admit that the that force can be moral and that you can't be moral without using force. This is you know Ben Gurion who was the Ooh. founding father of this country uh, bequeathed us the 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 sense that it is immoral to remain weak because if you are weak you cannot do good in the world and this kitschy um pseudo um ethical thinking which is when you're a complete victim then you're completely innocent then mm-hmm. everything is fine no that's very good so w- one of the things that that seems to have happened is that we've um as a result of the way in which that end of history thinking allied with this cult of the victim and the idea that the victim is is innocent and therefore anything he does is probably our fault um has led to this um kind of moral collapse really and and the the, the news services whether it's the cnn or the bbc which unfortunately i i have to watch in in hungary um uh, it seems to have lost all um, moral coordination on this um, and not even moral coordination, just basic newsworthiness around the issue of the bombing of the Gaza hospital, which didn't bomb the hospital. It bombed a car park and uh, was done by Islamic Jihad. But BBC reporters didn't even bother to fact check Um so, so there seems that not only this moral collapse, just basic standards of journalism seem to have been abandoned in the pursuit of this sort of guilt tripping, I suppose, this guilt tripping narcissism. Exactly, because it, it is more important to uh, indulge in moral grandstanding than it is to do good in the world. And I've encountered that in many ways. Um, a, a friend of mine, Igal Karmon, who's the head of a, an institution that translates Arabic, uh, the Arabic press, has compiled a report a, about radical Islam in mosques in North America, not in the Middle East, in North America, in the United States and Canada. And nobody is willing to touch the report because 95% of it is anti-Semitic, some of it rabid anti-Semitic, actual calls to murder Jews in mosques, and Jewish American communities won't touch it because people are so afraid to be called Islamophobic that they will not say the simple truth. And as uh, I think it was Andrew McCarthy who, who, who remarked, Islamophobia is not really a phobia. It was a term invented by the Muslim Brotherhood in order to discourage any criticism of Sharia supremacy ideology. That's what it is. And people are so afraid in polite society that they've lost the instinct to protect their own communities. These people should have warned their flock that, that a danger is looming on the horizon and they're doing nothing. And you know, the Obama administration didn't allow you to say radical Islam. You had to say oh. radical extremism. Yes, that's right. And and it was the idea that they were, even the term radical is, is a misuse of the term radicalism because you're really dealing with fanaticism, which is a very different yeah. Um, yeah. source of motivation, really. So, so the, 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 the thing that you're, you know, sort of coming to is, um, one of the problems that Israel has is its dependence on the U.S. and the way that, you know, particularly under Obama and, you know, Biden is a sort of rerun of Obama in many ways. I mean, uh, one of the most egregious um, aspects of Obama's foreign policy was the opening to Iran and um, Iran and Hezbollah are, 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 are not going away, even if um, Hamas is completely, you know, emasculated. Yeah, uh, uh, my, my co-host, uh, Mike Duran, uh, who, who's an expert on these things, reprimanded me that I'm being too too harsh with Biden. But my, my interpretation is that Tony Blinken and Joe Biden came to Israel with such urgency in order to save their uh, appeasement of Iran from this explosion. So note what they have been doing. They have been, first of all, they 
refuse to say that Iran is involved, although we have clear and and obvious signs that Iran was involved, including testimonies from Hamas. We know, we don't have only enough uh, Iran's fingerprints. We also know that the the Islamic Jihad is an arm of the Quds Force, which belongs to the to the revolutionary to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard in in Iran. So they've isolated this from their from Iran in order not to in in order not to have it reflect on their Iran policy. And where is the link that connects? Us, it's in the middle with Hezbollah, which is a more, more directly connected to Iran because there are Shiites in mm-hmm. Lebanon on our border. So what the U.S. did immediately was try to deter. Here is here is where our interests converge temporarily mm-hmm. because their Iran policy is horrendous for us. And one repercussion is this attack. If Iran did not have the money and the political wiggle room that the Biden administration gave it, it could have not. Uh, operated its proxy Hamas in mm. such an awful way, but now we we have a temporary convergence of interest because the the Americans have sent uh, a, a, a an aircraft carrier to to de- to deter Hamas to deter sorry Hezbollah yeah. in the north because they don't want this to mushroom into a full blown conflict, which would mean in an election year to their voters Mm. that their Iran policy has set the region on fire. So Mm. they're not here to save us. They're here to save their Iran policy. And it's a shame that within these parameters, they forced us to uh, allow so-called humanitarian aid while these people are still holding our hostages. The Israeli position originally was no water until you return the hostages. And if, if if we if we loosen the siege, we are losing one of the most important levers mm. on, on Hamas. Then there was also these, these repeated remarks, you alluded to this, about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, the rules of war. The, yes. When you said that, that the media is accepting the Hamas version, the Hamas version is screaming, hey, bloody murder, you're hitting civilians. But according to the rules of war, they are committed committing a war crime by hiding their uh, uh, soldiers and war material among citizens and the war the, the same rules allow you to attack any military target and if you hit civilians because they are human shields that the that blood should be on their hands but we are getting warnings first from biden then from obama that the united states will not tolerate um, um, civilian casualties. They don't remember what they did in Raqqa and Mosul, where, who, which were raised to the ground with the cost of something like 30,000 civilians. So after 2,000 civilians here who, are, who Hamas deliberately sacrifices, we are getting reprimanded. So I'm asking you, what, what, do you, what is the lesson from this? That Hamas can savagely and intentionally hurt any civilian that they want, torture them, rape them, dismember them, burn them alive. And then if they hide in populated neighborhoods, oh, so Israel should say, <laughs> oh, in that case, it's it, we can't do anything. No, it's, it's unacceptable. I agree. I mean, I thought you put that very well, but it seems that that perspective is not going away. And, you, you, you know, you can trace it, for instance, you know, when I was writing about, well, going back to um, Salman Rushdie, when the whole idea of Islamophobia kicked off in the UK, um, through the, you know, the the M- Prophet Muhammad cartoons, to the Charlie Hebdo events, and the always insistence that, um, uh, you know, the, these the, you have to understand the motives for the violence. And it's to do with victimization, and it's due to the insult to the prophet, and you should be um, much more respectful to Islamic grievances and Islamic um, modes of behavior. And and, and this has now sort of um, become so endemic in, well, in in the UK. I mean, you talk about mosques in in America and um, uh, Canada, um, I, I suspect they're far worse in in Birmingham and in Finchley Park in London, where you know it, it's become a, a well, Hizbut Tahrir, the the so-called non-violent wing of radical Islamism, is allowed to freely advocate the slaughter of Jews, even though it says, well, we don't mean that in a 
in an actual sense of some kind. But, you know, Britain has become, uh, in fact, I, I think one of the um, uh, Hamas leaders is, is in a council house in London, but um, not under arrest, not under in, in any interdiction. And the Palestinian movement is is kind of orchestrated not out of the Gaza Strip, but increasingly out of centres like London. Um, and th this seems to me to be, you know, part of our problem, really, that, that the West, as you said at the beginning, has lost all its moral compass. But we seem to be even further going down the road that we thought we'd temporarily abated when Islamic State were defeated. What we see now is nothing had happened, nothing had changed, and all those elements are, are still around waiting for, you know, the next um, incident that can create the the basis for this sort of, you know, apocalyptic conflict between Islam and the infidel. I was most worried when, when the possibility seemed real that Jeremy Corbyn would be elected. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert on British culture, although I spent a year in Britain and in, when I was a child because my, my, my father had a sabbatical. And ever since I liked British sweets and I eat Marmite, yeah. which is a, a rarity among the non-English, yes. the non-British. Um, but, but my guess is that in, in Britain, since in World War II, it did not take part in the actual, n not in the direct extermination of Jews and not as uh, uh, complicit as some countries mm. were, since it consistently stood against the Nazis, there is much less guilt feeling. And mm. so there, uh, and so there is guilt feeling about colonialism only. So that makes it that that makes a, a for for a toxic brew where you can disguise your anti-colonial views as anti-Zionism and therefore indulge your anti-Semitism in a way that seems impeccably moral. And this is a disgusting brew that we are fighting all the time because I, I've been saying for a while that human rights as a code, as a as as a as a, a a, a discourse structure has become the new vehicle for anti-Semitism yes. in many ways. And and when you look at, there was an amazing series, a documentary series here made by an Israeli NGO, which is very bold. It's it, th These people come from the IDF. And, and what they did is they planted a Scandinavian girl inside a human rights organization. And she penetrated it, which was really sweet. So Ooh. the whole thing is with the discussion. You can't see her face, but she had a camera. Ooh. And she penetrated this thing all the way through to Hamas, to Ooh. Hamas finances. Yeah. It's these people speaking the name of human rights, and they are connected financially to the, to these terrorists, those who committed these atrocities. And, this, and, and you see it in a more, I'd say, um, ben, benign, way when when those organizations operating on the international theater are consistently doing the exact opposite of what human rights should mean that is that is using double standards not all humans are are the same for them because they have one standard for jews mm -hmm. and, and and they and they formulate their blood libels about how jews are bloodthirsty and kill children in the language of the goldston report yeah no, I, I I think that's that that that's very very um, uh, interesting that that sort of uh, slippage from human rights into human wrongs has has become so so um, abundantly evident. I suppose the, the part of the problem also, you know, we, we, you know, the media has got a lot of culpability in in all this. The the, the way in which the media has changed, you know, I never remember BBC reportage being so inept really and um mediocre and slanted but one of the the things about you know both bbc and cnn is they've got huge ac ac access to the gaza strip so they, they 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 will perpetually be putting out images of um you know children and women you know screaming and and, and suffering and always attributing the the suffering to Israel, not to Hamas. I mean, how can in any way Israel or those who are 
sim obviously sympathetic to what Israel is standing for, um, do anything about this? This is a very thorny question. And I've, I don't have a, a, a proven recipe, but my sense is that once you get into the apology game and Israel has been trying to act far, far more uh, um, uh, scrupulously than international law permits. So we have put ourselves in a place where we are always apologizing. I don't know what would have happened if after the, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the slaughter of 1400 uh, Jews, we would have bombed a neighborhood flat in Gaza, Bomber Harris style. Mm. People may have still been in the zone where they understand, and and we should. And the Hamas is winning this war because they know how calculated we are. And you know, Richard Nixon had a, a had an argument that he called the 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 mad president theory. Yeah, yeah. He said the other side needs to think that you're unpredictable and wild, and therefore the other side would be put on notice. We're not putting the other side on notice. To this day, we're distributing leaflets before we bomb. Yeah. No, I understand that. But it it seems to me, it's, you know, the madman theory works if you're, you know, say... A superpower. Yeah, superpower. <laughs> but also if you're looking at, you know, the, the power you're against, which is, say, Russia or China, you haven't got um, the same kind of um, internal uh, sympathy with... Um, with you know, in the, in the sixties or seventies, there was probably a few communists, you know, um, that 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 were uh, you know deeply suspicious of Nixon's um, opening to China. But um, uh, generally, you know, there was a domestic support for whatever Nixon was doing. In, in, in this case, you've you've got the problem that you've got a domestic constituency and particularly an elite and progressive media in the in the universities in the mainstream media that immediately say it's you know the madman theory oh that just shows how bad and mad you know um israel is i, I i'm not sure whether the madman theory would would sell in what as you have said is is main well you know it's pro Partly, and in, and in, in left the West terms, it's an information war, and unless you know how the information is controlled, how the information is managed, it, it is central to how um, uh, how how we can um, uh, continue our you know the, the, this this war really. Yes, and I, you know I've been in the information war for a quarter of a century. Uh, since since uh, since it dawned on me that post Zionism, the local version of post colonial theory, is going to undermine the, the things that we talked about: our moral compass and our confidence in the uh, the uh, the basic justice of of Zionism, which is the right of the Jewish people to be, as our Declaration of Independence says, like all peoples, master of its own fate in Ooh. its own sovereign state. And and so, so this disease comes from the universities. Now, when you see how it bloomed into this, in, at Harvard University, the, the, the president of the university protects the right of students to support murderous Hamas uh, this is a Nazi ideology. They're, they're, killing Jews is their is the central pillar of their of their ideological commitment, and this goes under the freedom of speech protection. While absolutely, I know a, ma a MAGA demonstration would be kicked off ca campus because Donald Trump is horrendous, but Hamas is not. Mm. So at one point, I was hoping this would collapse. Mm. It's a big question if this was would collapse before the West or yes. uh, would collapse the West? Absolutely. I think that's, um, you know, that's a crucial issue. We're, we're running out of time, Gaddy. So if we could just um, uh, well, sum up perhaps in, in, in two minutes, what do you think the West can do going forward to try and uh, give Israel the support that it needs in this, um, you know, chilling environment. 
I think that until the West comes to its senses in this in in the sense that we are talking now, realizing that you can't that multiculturalism is a contradiction in turn, that you can't, yeah. in the name of tolerance, accept people who burn gays alive. It just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And that, that your, your conclusion from the Charlie Hebdo episode is new laws against blasphemy in, instead of new laws for the freedom of religion and, and laws, stricter laws against violence and, and terrorism. So in the short run, I think it, it is an opportunity to look at this dangerous regime in Iran and the the retreat of the West from the Middle East and the idea that this administration caused by euphemisms such as regional integration and de-escalation, appeasing Iran or something like Iran is like appeasing Hitler. It there and they're going to have a nuclear weapon. So I think and this is not going to be an Israeli problem alone because there will be a nuclear uh, arms race in the Middle East, and that that will influence everybody. Europe is not not that far, and America is not that far, and the world is small. So the, I, I'm hoping that our, we, we would wake up from the idea that when there is such a rogue state with a racist, murderous ideology, um, we we cannot afford to just contain it. We need to uh, we 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 need to neuter its power. Excellent. Okay, Gary, we'll we'll leave it there, and um, hopefully we can follow up on this in a week or two's time to see where we are uh, in in our you know um, post end of history condition. Thank you for having me, David. Uh, great to talk. A pleasure. To you. A pleasure too. Bye. Goodbye.